so many good things going on in the church right now. I have fallen so in love with this church and what God's doing in it, and I would not choose to be anywhere else in the world. There you go. That's what I was looking for right there, right there. Me too, me too. Oh man, I, I love, we come to this time of year and Sarah mentioned to you, fall feast is coming up. Do I have any service team members in here this morning? All right, so you're gonna get your invitation this week. As she told you, we're gonna have our third annual Barney Awards. And I think a handful of you know what that is. Most of you are like, what in the world? Uh, let me just tell you, Barney is named after an individual in the New Testament named Barnabas. And uh, Barnabas is actually not even that guy's real name. If you do a little study, you find out his name was Joseph or Joseph, and uh, the disciples actually changed his name. This guy was such a giver, and the Bible records one of the offerings he brought to the church. He went and sold a bunch of land and brought it and laid the proceeds at the apostles' feet, and it says they renamed him. They named him Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. Now that's a lot better than some other son names. This is son, come on, son of encouragement. That's what they named this guy. Now we've heard people talk before about naming your seed, but this guy's seed named him. His whole identity changed because of the, the generosity that was pouring out of his life. And so we take time every year to honor you, our service team members, those who are actively involved. And one of the things we have all of our team leads do is pick one person from their team that just has stood out and has demonstrated such um, service and encouragement. And you don't realize, you do not realize how encouraging your service is. It encourages Sarah and I, it encourages the people you serve, and encouragement is basically just saying to somebody, keep going, keep going, keep going. And when you get involved in church and serving the Lord, what you're saying to us as a church, what you're saying to this family is, come on, let's keep this thing going. Let's just keep going and let's just keep growing. So the Barney Awards are coming up and we always have such a fun time, fun time with that. Jordan is our annual host for the Barney Awards. So you never really know what's gonna happen. Jordan moves in mysterious ways. <laughs> Things are so good in our church, praise the Lord. Um, I think we're gonna receive our offering at the end of the uh, message today. I've got some things I wanna share with you. Those of you who've been with us for the last several weeks, you know here in the month of October, we call it October overflow, overflow. Somebody say overflow. overflow. Now you can't say overflow like overflow. That is the opposite of overflowing. Come on, so it's October overflow, overflow. We're believing God to overflow in every area of, this, of our lives and this ministry. And I gotta tell you, it's happening. I just read to you this report of the debts being paid for. Uh, I've got a great report coming for you in a couple of weeks about the progress we're continuing to make in our debt payoff in the church, our Jubilee project, even though all this month, our offerings are being designated to our general operations account, G-O, general operations. That's the account that just keeps things going. That's the account that pays the staff. That's the account that uh, keeps the lights on. That's the account that buys cleaning supplies. Did you hear that testimony this morning about the family that was so ministered to? Check this out. By diapers? Yes. Diapers? Some of you uh, parents with little ones, Tell me the truth. Can you be ministered to by diapers? Yes. yes, you can. Why? Diapers is expensive. They are. And man, you go through them quick. I'll tell you that. But diapers, that kind of stuff comes out of this general operations account. And it's one of the ways we bless our families. It's one of the ways we minister to the children. Um, that family talked about how they came loaded with diapers and snacks. And what did our children's team tell them? We got snacks. We got diapers. You have done that, church. When you sow into the general operations account of this church, you're putting snacks on the table. You're putting diapers on bottoms, and they're so thankful, and we're th everybody's thankful for that. Amen. 
Thank you, Lord. So at the end of our message today, everything once again is going into that GO, general operations account. And the last several weeks, as you all have given into that, it is, it's been wonderful to see. It's encouraging. And that account, it was strong and getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And we've been declaring overflow for the last several weeks. And we are experiencing it. The finances is one part of it. But uh, we are experiencing it in every part of the church. I want you just to look around this morning. Uh, we have come to the place over the last several weeks where there's more and more people coming to church. And we are literally seeing overflow. Uh, Tyler, help me out. How many parking spaces do we have in our lot? A hundred and... 126 spaces in our parking lot. How many cars did we have last week? 177. You don't have to be that good at math to know that 177 is what? Overflow. It's overflow. Uh, we got reports from our children's ministers on our children team last week. We had 15 babies in the children's class. You may think 15, that doesn't sound like a lot. Well, I'll tell you what. We'll send 15 babies home with you today. We'll put 15 babies in your living room, and you tell me if it sounds like overflow. Oh, it's overflow. It's overflow. It's happening in our four and five-year-old class. Our children's classes are filling up. So uh, we are actually looking right now and have been for quite some time. You know, we've got the plan to rearrange some things upstairs, build out some new spaces for the kids. But it's, it's causing us to come back and make sure that our plan is right because we want there to be enough room. Not just enough room for you in here or your car in the parking lot, but we want our children uh, effectively ministered to, which means we can only have so many kids in a class when we have... Uh, uh, volunteers or service team members, you can't have more than the, the ratio. So we want to make sure we have the right amount of teachers for the right amount of kids. We want nobody neglected. We want every child attended to, ministered to, loved on. And we, we believe that um, one of the keys to strong attendance in church is when your kids come and wake you up on a Sunday morning. That Sunday you thought, well, let's just stay home today. And your kids say, we ain't staying home. I'm going to church. Get me up and take me to church. And we believe one of the keys to strong attendance is your kids bringing you. Your kids getting you up because they love the presence of God and they love what they're hearing and experiencing in church. Amen. So we are overflowing, but I want you to know we are hard at work making sure that we've got the right spaces and we'll do whatever the Lord says do to make sure everybody is taken care of. Glory to God. You bring a Bible with you this morning. Let's dig right in together. Open to a couple of places with me. First of all, John chapter 10. This is our foundation scripture for overflow. If we're going to shout about it, if we're going to believe God for it, we have got to see it in his word. We cannot just make stuff up. Oh, come on now. Are you listening to me? You cannot just make stuff up. Faith doesn't just make stuff up. Faith is rooted in the Word of God. Faith is built upon the Word of God. If you see it in the Word, you can have it. If you see a precedent set in the Word of God, you have foundation to believe God to have it in your own life. So if we're going to talk about overflow, shout about overflow, how many think we need to see it in the Word first? Well, we see it right here. John chapter 10, verse 10, so familiar to you. Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I want to draw your attention to those words. He said, I came that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. The Amplified Classic Bible, put that on the screen for us. Jesus said it like this, the thief comes only in order to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance, which means to the full till it overflows. There you go. There's your foundation for it. And it's not just in one area of life. Don't be guilty of of limiting things. Don't, don't hear the words of Jesus and think, well, he was talking about this one area only. He said life, which means life. He said that this would affect every area of your life. 
that you would have so much life in you that you would be, you'd be enjoying the kind of life that he came to give that it would begin to fill up in you and overflow out of you. So this is the foundation for believing God for overflow in every area of life. I like it from the Passion Translation. If we have that, put that up as well. Jesus said, but I have come to give you everything. Everything. That's not just one thing. That's not just two things. Not, that's not just one area in neglect of all others. Everything means what? Everything. I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect. Life in its fullness until you overflow. Overflow. So overflow is when you and I begin to affect the people around us. Overflow is how we love each other. The scripture talks about you always having all sufficiency in all things. Now, if it stopped right there, that'd be good news, except it would be all about you. You having all sufficiency in all things. But that's just about you. But that's not where he stopped. He said that you always having all sufficiency in all things might have an abundance, same word Jesus used, might have an overflow to give, might have an overflow to reach out and impact somebody else in the life around you. So overflow is how we love each other. Overflow is how we minister to each other. This is the reason we need to be believing God for overflow. It's a good thing and it's fine to believe God for overflow in your own life, your own family, to meet your own desires. That's fine. It's fine. It's wonderful. But that's not the fullness of the assignment on extra. This is where we love one another. This is where we minister to each other. This is where we get ourselves off our minds. And if you've never gotten yourself off your mind, then you've never really been happy. You've never enjoyed life until you have forgotten all about you. The most satisfying times, the most rewarding times in life are when you forget about you and you get somebody else on your mind. You get somebody else in your heart. And this is the best way to break depression. This is the best way to break heaviness in your life is to forget about you. Come on, say, forget you. Look at your neighbor. No, don't say, never mind. <laughs> No, we come to the place where we forget ourselves and we overflow and the assignment on that overflow is others. Amen. But look back at what Jesus said here. John chapter 10, verse 10, he said, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. One of the things you're going to find out about God as you study him and come to know him through his word, is that even though he is, he is love, he doesn't just have love, he is love, but he has never forced that love on anybody. Because love forced on somebody is not love. It's actually just creepy. God has never forced love on anybody. He's such a God of abundance. He's such a God of richness. He's such a God of grace and mercy and kindness. And yet he's never forced it on anyone. And sometimes I think, you know, we, we wish he would. Come on, force some of that prosperity on me, Lord. Force some of that. No, no, that's not love. Love does not force. The greatest thing love has done and can do for anyone is create opportunity. He has made this life more abundantly available. And as much as you would want him to force abundant life on you, Jesus just said, I came that you may have it. It's available. It's bought. It's paid for. It's yours if you want it. It's yours if you'll take it. But I'm not forcing it on you. And you know this to be true. In our own relationships, you cannot force love on another person. It quits being love. It quits being love. And people get some crazy, wild, weird ideas when they fall so in love with somebody and the other person doesn't feel the same way about them. Oh, I'll make them. 
The, tr the harder you try, the more you push them away. You try to force love on somebody and it does nothing but push them away. So what does love do? Creates opportunity. Love makes itself available. Available. And so what Jesus has said is, I've come that you may have it. It's yours if you want it. I make it available to you. Now hold your place here in John 10 because we're going to come right back to it. But look at this other scripture that we're building this month upon. It comes from the book of Isaiah chapter 1. We looked at this last week. Let's talk more about it today. Isaiah chapter 1. And we'll look at verses 19 and 20. Don't lose John 10. We'll go right back to it. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19 says, If you are willing and obedient, what's going to happen? You will eat the good of the land. If, if you're willing and if you're obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Or for the sake of our study, we'll say it like this. If you're willing and obedient, you will experience overflow. And this is whenever the Lord talks to his people, particularly in the Old Testament, but their lives are an example for us. And he talked to them about the land. He started talking to them about the land way back when they were slaves in Egypt. And he sent Moses to preach to them good news. And what was that good news? I got a land for you. I've got a land and that land flows with milk and honey. Or you might say it overflows with provision. It's a good land. He, he said this land is so fertile, man, you plant in it, it's going to produce because it's flowing with every good thing that you need. So when the scripture talks to us about the land, he's talking to us about um, it, its ability to sustain us, to keep us, to strengthen us. And he said here, if, somebody say if, yeah. I'm not going to force the good of the land on you. Come on, just force it on me, Lord. I'm not eating the good of the land. I just need you to force it on me. Come on, my mouth open, just shove it down. <laughs> not going to do it. Love doesn't do that. Love doesn't do that. Love says, okay, listen, it's available to you. It's yours if you want it. I've, I've made a way for you to have it and to eat the best of this land. Not the bad, not the old wore out, not the falling apart, not the junkie, the best, the good of the land. But there's a key. Remember last week we talked about connecting these dots. We got to connect the dot of overflow back to where it really began. And it began with obedience, obedience and overflow. If you are Willing and obedient. Willing and obedient. Now, so many people think they want nothing to do with God. They think they want nothing to do with church or what they call religion. Because they think, you know, God's just after people that'll just do what he says, just obey, obey. It's all about obedience, all about obedience. And, and nobody wants to submit. Well, that's a, that's a bad thing. That, that resistance to submission, that'll take you nowhere good. But it's worth noting here, God's actually not just looking for obedience. If all he was looking for was obedience, you know what he would have made? Robots. Robots. Because all you got to do is give a robot a command and it will do what the command says. If that's all he was looking for, he could have very easily made a being like that where you just input a command and the being does what the creator said. The only problem with a robot is it doesn't have a heart. He created us with a heart, which is why he said, if you be, oh, that's a heart thing. If you be willing, if your heart is willing, it will produce obedience. And then you're going to eat the good of the land. You will overflow. But he connected it back to obedience. Let me read this verse to you from a couple of other translations. The BBE, Basic Bible English says, if you will give ear, if you'll give ear to my word and do it, the good things of the land will be yours. So this is how this translation translates willing and obedient. What does it mean to be willing and obedient? It means to give ear. Give ear to the word and what else? Do it. Listen and do what you're told. 
the ERV, easy to read version says, if you listen to what I say, you will get the good things from this land. So when he says, if you're willing and obedient, what he's really saying is, if you'll listen. If you will listen and do what you're told. This sounds so simple, but I'm gonna make a statement to you and you're gonna think to yourself, how could it really be that simple? But I believe it is. The, are you listening to me? The biggest problem in the world is people who won't listen. People who will not listen to the voice of God. That's the biggest problem. Because verse 20 in Isaiah chapter 1 goes on to say, what? If you refuse and if you rebel, you're going to be devoured by the sword. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Again, this ERV version translates that like this. If you refuse to listen and rebel against me, your enemies will destroy you. One translation says you're going to be consumed. So he's given you a choice here. Do you want to consume or be consumed? Well, what's happening all around us right now? Everywhere we look, out in the world and in the culture we live in, all over the world, people are being consumed, are they not? They're being consumed by violence. They're being consumed by sickness, being consumed by debt, being consumed everywhere you look. But it doesn't have to be that way for us. As long as we will, what? Listen and obey. You won't be consumed. You will actually consume. You'll consume the good of the land. But you got to connect it back to this dot. Listening and doing what you're told. Could it really be that simple? That the biggest problem, that all of our problems could be solved if we would listen? Go back to John 10. John chapter 10. Once again, Jesus made this promise. He said, I came that you'd have life and have it more abundantly. But I want you to take that verse and put it back in the context of what he's saying here and and listen to what it's connected to. In other words, if he said, you may have it, well, that's good news. But our question should be, okay, Jesus, how may I have it? How do I experience life more abundantly? How do I eat the good of the land? When, how do I experience overflow? Okay, we'll listen to what he said. Back up to the beginning of this chapter and look at what he's saying. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Well, you're not overflowing if you're being robbed from But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. Does this sound like listening? He opens the door to the good shepherd and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he does what? Leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. Why? Because they don't know that voice. They don't follow that voice because it's a strange voice to them. What's Jesus telling us here? You may have life more abundantly. Great news, right? What's our question? How? I want it. I desire it. He said it's connected to you hearing his voice and following him. He's saying, follow me, follow me. And you're going, all right, well, where are we going? And what's he say? We are headed to life more abundantly. That's where we're going. That's the destination he's leading us to. But can you see here that there is a connection between life more abundantly and hearing the voice of our good shepherd and following the voice of our good shepherd? Oh, they're, they're connected inseparably. In other words, you cannot have life more abundantly apart from hearing his voice, following his voice. The same way you cannot and will not eat the good of this land apart from willingness, apart from obedience, apart from listening and doing what you're told. 
I, I can tell just looking around, it, it's still, it's feeling like too simple to, to some people. It really is this simple. It really is this simple. Listening and obeying. Here in John 10, Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd. And he said, my sheep know my voice. You know, when we sit up here in church, we read scriptures like this, and we talk about God speaking to us. We talk about knowing his voice. I guarantee you there is probably nobody in here who has any problem with that. You don't take issue with me saying God said or or even you're saying it yourself. You know, I heard God say this or God spoke this to me or uh, I, I heard God say this through his word. These are just, they, they come to be normal ways of talking for you and I. Have you noticed though, the moment you take that concept out into the world and you say, God said, you get some looks from some folks. Sorry, what now? You said what now? Yeah, God, God said, really, God said, you telling me God speaks to you, you, you hear that? I mean, this is, this is a very basic, fundamental, foundational principle for us as believers, us as sheep, us as sheep, right? This is easy for us. You take this outside this environment and people think you're crazy. No, like literally crazy. Like you need to go somewhere, check into that place for 30 days because you are crazy thinking you hear voices. But the truth is we're not hearing voices. What are we hearing? Voice. The voice of our good shepherd. Let them look at you funny. Let them call you crazy. Let them worry about you. People worry about folks that say they hear from God. One guy said, it's all those folks that don't hear from God I get worried about. <laughs> We're not talking about hearing voices. No. We're talking about hearing one voice. The voice of our good shepherd. So why don't you say it out loud? Jesus, Jesus is, my good shepherd. is my good shepherd. Say it like this. He calls me by my name. He calls me by my name. What does that do for you? That, that's, that should be a lot sweeter to us than I think it has been. He knows my name. He's got a lot of sheep, like a lot of sheep, but he knows my name. My shepherd knows my name, which says to me, there is a level of intimacy available to you and him that you may not be walking in right now, but it's there. You may have it. It's available to you. He knows my name. He knows my name. Does this ever happen in your family? Especially if you come from a family with a bunch of kids, or maybe even just a, a couple of kids. Did, did the mom or you or whoever in the family, especially if she was upset, if she went to call your name, but she called you by everybody else's name first? <laughs> if you were the youngest and there's a few in line ahead of you, did it take about three or four or five or six efforts of getting down to who, who are you again? I got an uncle Gary and I got called Gary, especially when mom was up, Gary, get my, get, who, who are you again? I remember one time I, I've told the story before. Maybe you've heard it. My grandfather and I were actually on his television broadcast uh, and he and I were recording a couple of weeks of, of TV broadcast together, ministering. And, um, we got in there early that morning and got set up there at the, the TV uh, set. We sat down at the table and they got the cameras ready and the lights on and all that. And there's a lot of preparation that goes into it. But when everybody's set and ready, the floor director will count us down. We look into the camera and he'll say, uh, we're, we're on in 10, 9, 8. And he'll count down all the way, 3, 2, 1. And if you're sitting there with Brother Copeland, they'll point at him and he'll say, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcast. I'm Kenneth Copeland. Let's pray and get into the Word of God. And so he did that. And then he turned to me and he said, now we've got a guest with us today. And he said, now we're going to get into the scripture. Now, now, Jerry, I want you to take it. <laughs> and, and just a few seconds later, he caught himself. Jerry, I'm sorry, Jeremy. <laughs> We're going to look at the scriptures today. And uh, so, you know, he, he corrected it. I don't know if it was later in that same broadcast or when we went to shoot the next one. He did it again. 
my papa, my flesh and blood. Without this man, I am not. You know what I mean? This, th this figure in my life called me Jerry. Now, in his defense, he has been preaching for about the last 50 or 60 years with a man named Jerry. So I get it. But what's my point here? My point is, Jesus has never called me Jerry. <laughs> Not one time. Never have I come before him. Jesus, I come before you. Well, hey, Jerry. I mean, <laughs> Jesus has never once called me Jerry. Even when your family misses it. Even when the closest ones to you after the flesh in the natural, even as close as we are to them, there is an intimacy available between you and Jesus that's even closer. There is a friend that sticks closer than a papa, <laughs> closer than a brother. Jesus is my good shepherd and he calls me by my name and he leads me out. He leads me out. That's what Jesus said he would do. So why don't you say it again? Jesus, Jesus is, my is my good shepherd. He calls me by my name, me by my name. and he leads me out. He leads me out. out of what? Out of whatever it is you're in that you need out of, <laughs> he's your good shepherd. Amen. And without taking testimonies or raising hands, who in here has ever been in something oh. You need it out of in a bad way. And even if you're in the middle of it right now, pressure around you, financial pressure, physical pressure, pressure at home or work or school or whatever it is, pressure closing in on you, this should be your confession. Jesus, you are my good shepherd. You call me by my name and you lead me out. You're leading me out of this. You're leading me out of not enough. You're leading me out of lack. You're leading me out of shortage. You're leading me out of sickness. You're leading me out of sin. You're leading me out. But the good news is he's never led you out of anything without leading you in to something else, something better, something greater. So when you called on him and made him the Lord of your life, he started right then leading you out of sin and into his righteousness, leading you out of darkness and into the kingdom of his light, leading you out of death and into life, leading you out of sickness and into healing and health, leading you out of poverty into life more abundantly overflowing. How are you getting there? Following him, following him. He's speaking. We're listening. We're following. Where's he taking us? Life more abundantly. Where we're eating the good of the land. Amen? Come on, say amen if you believe any of this. He's our good shepherd. Don't ever again, ever, say that you can't hear his voice. Never say it again. Never make that claim. I'm trying to hear God, but I can't. I'm trying to hear his voice, but I can't. No, you can. Are you his sheep? I said, are you his sheep? Yes. Say, bah, men, if you're his sheep. <laughs> there you go. Do you like that one? I was working on that one last night. <laughs> Making my notes. I actually almost wrote it in the notes. Say, bah, men. If you're... <laughs> you're his sheep. I'm his sheep. And he said, my sheep hear my voice. So don't say you don't hear his voice. You do hear his voice. You hear his voice every time you open the Bible. That's him speaking to you. So start right there. If he wants to say something else to you about it, he will. But you start right there. And that's where you begin to familiarize yourself with his voice. You begin to hear him and recognize him as he speaks to you through the scriptures. That's why everybody at Legacy Church reads their chapter every day, Monday through Friday. We do this together. Why are we doing that? Because you are familiarizing yourself with his voice. We were reading it this week. And Jesse, our daughter, she's 10 years old. What were we reading this week? It was either Philemon. I know, I think we got to Hebrews. Do we get to Hebrews this week? Yes. Hebrews chapter one. Jesse read Hebrews chapter one. She looked at me. She said, I have no idea what he just said. <laughs> and I told her, it's okay. It's okay. And it really is. I mean, is it, could it be okay to read it and think, well, I don't know what that's about. 
you are familiarizing yourself with his voice. And you would be amazed if you'll just read in faith, you'll be amazed what gets in. Even when your head's going, what now? I, huh? Explain this to me. Your heart. Your heart gets it. And as long as you're reading in faith, it's getting down on the inside of you. And you will be amazed what comes back up out of your mouth when you need it the most. Because you put it in there. And one of the main things you're doing is you're just getting to know his voice. And I don't know if anybody is old enough. I'm sure that we've got a handful in here. You're old enough to remember the days before caller ID. Does anybody remember that? Before caller ID. I remember what that was like. I remember what it was like to be sitting at the dinner table as a young kid in my parents' home and the phone on the wall. We used to nail phones to the wall. And it had this long curly cord attached to it. And you could walk, but only as far as that cord. Anybody else experience this as you're on the phone? But I remember being a kid sitting at the dinner table and the phone would ring. And it was like we all looked at each other like, I wonder who it is. Because you didn't know. There was nothing that came up and told you who's calling you. So it was like this excitement and anticipation. I wonder who's calling. And my dad would usually say, if it was dinner time, the phone would ring. He'd look at my mom and say, it's your mother. It's like <laughs> Grammy just had a way of knowing right when to call. But if you never experienced that, if you never experienced picking up the phone and not knowing who was on the other end, then you never experienced the cold sweat that would start running down your back when you said hello and they said, hey, it's me. <laughs> and you didn't know. You weren't sure. Come on, grown-ups. Am I talking to anybody in here? You, you ever had somebody say, hey, it's me? And you didn't know who me was? Why? Why didn't we just say, I'm sorry, who's this? But instead, what would we do? Oh, hey. Hey there. You, how are, how are you? How are you? How are you doing? And you would just let them talk. And you would hope that at some point there was some vocal cue, some clue of who this was, and it would dawn on you. But it's a real risk, right? You're going to let them talk for five minutes, and if you don't know who it is, I'm finally going to say, I'm sorry. Uh, who is this? <laughs> hey, it's me. Now, we all have those people in our lives who could call us right now, and whether or not you have caller ID, they, they answer the phone or you answer the phone and say hello, and they say, hey, it's me, and you know who it is. I can do that with Sarah. I, I, if, she were to, if she were to be on the, other phone, on the other end and say, hey, it's me, I would not say, okay, I'm sorry, now who is this? Please explain yourself to me. And she wouldn't have to say, this is... Sarah Christine Hart Pearsons, you and I were married 16 years ago. We, we actually have two kids together now, and we, we pastor a church. Is this ringing any bells to you? She doesn't have to go through any of that. Why? I know that voice. I know that voice. And in that voice, and with that voice, I've got history, got experience, got life. And so we start... Our conversation, our fellowship with a place from a place of intimacy and I need no explanation. I know that voice. Did you know that you can have a hey, it's me relationship with Jesus? You can have a hey, it's me relationship with God. When he speaks through that still small voice on the inside, he calls you by your name and says, hey, it's me. You don't have to stand there and go, oh, I wonder who this is. Please explain yourself. But do you know people are suffering from that? I don't, is that God? Is that the devil? Was it just me? Folks, if we can't tell the difference between God and the devil, come on. We're confused. Those two voices sound nothing alike. 
in one of those voices is stealing, killing, and destroying. In another one is life, and life more abundantly. And you can have this kind of fellowship, this kind of friendship, where he speaks, and you know that voice, and you follow that voice, and you don't even second guess it. Why? Because you know where it's taken you. You are perfectly willing to put into practice to do whatever that voice, not voice says, but that one voice of your good shepherd speaks to you because you know where you're going. We're headed to life more abundantly. We're headed towards the good of the land if I'll follow this voice. Amen. Can you see this? So say it again. Jesus is my good shepherd. I hear his voice. Say this. I know his voice. I follow his voice. A stranger's voice, I do not follow. Amen. I'll give you one more story. We'll look at a couple more scriptures. Just after Sarah and I got married, we were married in September of 07. In January of the next year, we were beginning a series of messages to our youth group. She and I youth pastored together at my parents' church for a number of years. And I got it strong in my heart to teach the teenagers that, that night and for the next several weeks about hearing the voice of God. How many of you would, like, would have liked that as a teenager? If you could have heard his voice above every other voice. Well, that's what we desired to do was to give them, give them that kind of information. Talk about hearing the voice of God. And it was one of those days, it was... I knew I had that much direction from the Lord, but I didn't know where to start. I didn't know what to preach to him. And every time I'd start down a path in the scriptures, I'd hear the Lord say, back up, back up. And I could sense that he was telling me there, there's a better place to start. There's foundation that you have to lay before you can talk to them about here's how you hear his voice and all that. And he kept telling me to back up, back up, back up. And I finally got all the way back to asking this question, does God speak? Does God speak? And so I had that much thought about it, but I mean, the clock's ticking. I'm going to have to go to church here in just a little bit. I really don't have a message. And especially early in my ministry, those kind of things made me nervous. I thought, God, I got to say something. You got to give me something to say. I can't just get up there and stand there with my mouth open. I, I got to have something to say. And I started feeling the pressure of, of what do I say about this? What do I say about God speaking? I, I don't know. I don't know what to say about it. At that time, Sarah was leading worship in our youth ministry. So she would go to the church ahead of me by about an hour or so and get the band ready, lead rehearsal and do, do all that. And as she's getting in the car tonight, I keep hearing this voice on the inside. Don't let Sarah drive tonight. She was getting in the car ready to pull out and head to church. I would be following her, but I kept hearing this on the inside. Don't let Sarah drive tonight. And I wrestled with it. Why? Because I got to get a message on how to hear the voice of God. I got to get this message on does, does God speak? And my thought process was if I get in the car with her and I got to take her, I got to drive 15 minutes there, drop her off, turn around, drive 15 minutes home, then get ready. I still don't have a message. Then I'm going to have to turn right back around and go back to church. I'm not going to have what I need. Meanwhile, he's saying what? Don't let Sarah drive tonight. Don't let Sarah drive tonight. Well, I can't do that because I got to get this message on how to hear God's voice. So she got in the car, pulled out of the driveway, headed to church. 10 minutes later, I get a call from her. She's been in a wreck. Now I say wreck. Let me paint the picture. Between our house and the church, there was a long straightaway and it had hills. And um, sometimes you couldn't see over that next hill in front of you. But as she's coming down one of them, this road that we would travel had, a, had another road perpendicular to it and a stop sign. And there was this guy in a truck at that stop sign. And she's coming down that straightaway doing probably 55 miles an hour. He decides to pull out. Now, if it was just him, he could have made it. But he had tied to his truck, another truck. See, we have in Texas what we call rednecks. I don't know if you're familiar with that medical term or not. But <laughs> this guy had another truck that he was towing with a yellow strap tied in knots from his bumper to the 
front bumper of the other truck. He pulls out. Sarah goes right through that strap. Second earlier, she would have hit that first truck. A second later, she would have hit the truck behind him. She goes right through that strap. She calls me. She's fine. Uh, Everybody in, in those trucks are fine. So I jump in my truck and I head out to her. And there's some damage to her car. And I can see some of it kind of strewn across the road there. I think the police finally showed up. But I got my message for church that night. Here's the message. Does God speak? What's the answer? Yes. She used to drive at that time a little VW Jetta. And that VW emblem came out of the front of her car. And it was laying in the middle of the road with some other just pieces and things that had come off. I went and grabbed that thing. I still have it. I have that little VW in a box at the house. And it reminds me, God speaks. God speaks. And I don't care who calls us crazy. I know God speaks. God speaks. And there's an intimacy we can have with him through his voice if we'll come to love his voice. And if we'll come to follow that voice. He's speaking. Thank you, Lord. And we know where he's leading is to overflow. Go to the book of Luke as we begin to wrap this up. You find Luke chapter 5. I want to read a couple of things to you from the book of Genesis. And then I'll head over to Luke chapter 5 and we'll finish it there. The biggest problems in the world can be solved by listening. And I know this because not listening is where the world's problems began. In Genesis chapter 1, we read in verse 26. We'll have this on the screen for you. You'll find in Luke 5. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea. Interesting statement. Over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. And in the same image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, here's the blessing, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion, Over the fish of the sea. There's that dominion thing again. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Well, then you get down to chapter 2. In verse 8, it said, The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Every tree. You notice this, that was not just pretty to look at, but good for food. You talk about eating the good of the land. Nobody's ever eaten any better than this man and his wife ate in the Garden of Eden. They ate the good of the land. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now skip down if we look at uh, verse 15. It said, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. These two things, to tend it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. Here again, here again, eating the good of the land. Of every tree of the garden, you can freely eat, have as much as you want. But the tree of the, knowledge of, the good and, uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. God gave Adam a job. You hear me, men? Men were created and were given a job. Men should have a job. We were created to have a job. What was the job? To tend and to keep. If you look this word tend up, it literally means to cultivate. It actually means to work, to work the land. I don't know what image you've had of Adam in your mind before sin, if he was just laying around, lounging, just, you know, Eve was dropping grapes in his mouth. And he's just, no, this man's got a job. And his job was to cultivate the garden. And his, the other part of his job was to keep it. 
Now, this word means to protect and to guard. Men, we have the same job today. In our homes, our job is to cultivate an atmosphere of faith, an atmosphere of love, and to protect and to keep. Keep things that don't belong in, keep them out. Knowing that, can you see where Adam didn't do his job? He failed at doing his job. Now, God hired Adam, if you will. And if you notice, there was not a big, long orientation. There was no employee handbook. There were no classes that he had to sit through for days or weeks. Actually, the whole orientation was summed up like this. You can eat anything you want. Don't eat that one. Now go to work. That's a simple instruction, isn't it? This is the word of God. This is the voice of God. Simple instruction. Don't eat that one. Did they follow the instruction? Did they listen and obey or refuse and rebel? Rebellion. Not listening. Not doing what they were told to do through the door to sin and death wide open. And the curse came in because of not listening, because of not doing his job. And this is what God had to say to him in Genesis chapter three, verse 17. He said to Adam, because you've heeded the voice of your wife, or you could say it like this, because you didn't listen to my voice, because you listened to another voice, not the voice of the good shepherd, but a voice that wasn't his because you didn't listen to my voice, you've eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. He said, cursed is the ground for your sake, and in toil you shall eat of it. Now this word toil is very different from the word tend. His job was always to work. His job was always to tend and to cultivate. But because he didn't listen, and he went in a different direction... Now he's not eating the good of the land. Now God said to him, if you're going to eat, it's going to be by your own toil. He went on to say to him, it'll be in the sweat of your face that you eat bread. Toil and sweat. Why? Didn't listen. Toil and sweat. Don't you know Adam just looked back at God and said, what sweat? This man's never sweat for anything. He's always eaten the good of the land. He's always had perfect fellowship with God. And though he was working, if you will, there was grace to do it. But now he's got to sweat for it. And in toil, this word toil is not the word cultivate. This word toil is the word for painful labor. It's actually the exact same word God used when he said to Eve, this is what childbearing is going to be. Painful labor. He said this is to, to Adam. If you're going to eat, it's going to be the result of painful toil and labor. Does that sound like overflow? Does that sound like eating the good of the land? No. It sounds like being consumed. One reason and one reason only. Not listening. Not listening. And he lost his dominion. He lost his authority. He gave it all away. And what did that? One problem. Sin and death and the curse came in because of one reason. Man wouldn't listen. He refused and rebelled. Which is why God had to send Jesus. Because Jesus would be a man that would listen. A man that would finally listen. A man that would not refuse, that would not rebel. A man that would do exactly what he was told to do. A man that would say, I came from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. A man that would say, I delight to do your will. A man that would say, not my will, but yours be done. A man that would say, I don't say anything unless I, I hear it. I'm listening. A man that would say, I don't do anything unless I... See you first, Father, do it. This is the kind of man God had been looking for since the dawn of creation. 
And this is why he had to send Jesus. Now, I want you to notice from Luke chapter 5 what happens now as the result of a man who will listen and the example he sets for other men, other people who will listen. Uh, what did I tell you? Luke. Luke 5. It is in this Bible somewhere. There it is. Luke chapter 5. Verse 1. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he, Jesus, stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats, boats standing in the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled. We have been working all night long and it has not produced anything. Thanks, Adam. I'm serious. Does this sound like having dominion over the fish of the sea? This sounds like fish bossing them around. We have toiled, painful, wearisome, burdensome. These are all the words that define toil. Burdensome labor. It's the exact same word Jesus said when he said, come to me, all you who labor. You're working, you're sweating, and it's not producing anything. You're starving. You're not eating the good of the land. You're not overflowing. You lack everything. Come to me. Come to me. Okay, where are we going? To life. And life more abundantly to the full till it, till it, till it overflows. Launch out, he said. Out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. Peter said, but master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Now, whatever he says next, will determine whether he stays in lack or experiences overflow. And people are standing at that same crossroad every day of their lives. The voice of their good shepherd has brought them right there. And he's saying, now follow me this way. And they're going, yeah, but I've been working. That doesn't make sense. We worked all night. I don't even think there's any fish left in the sea. We, we've been sweating and toiling and it's painful all night long, produce nothing. Why would I go back out? That makes no sense. Why would I go back out? Why are we going back out? You know what I can hear Jesus saying? Because I said so. Because I said so. Notice he didn't explain to him, well, let me tell you what's about to happen here, Pete. We're heading out into the water. And you're going to catch so many fish that it's going to break that net and sink this boat. It's going to change your life. I'm going to call you into the ministry. You're going to be one of my 12 apart. Didn't explain any of it because I said so. He's got a choice to make. Willing and obedient, refuse and rebel. Aren't you glad? He said, nevertheless, at your word. At your word, because you said so, I will let down the net. So they launched out, they got into the deep water, and when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Somebody say, Overflow. Overflow. Come on, stand up and say it. Overflow. Musicians, you guys, come on up. Say it again. Overflow. Did, did Peter and the boys, they experience any kind of overflow that day? They experience any kind of excess? Did they? How? Jesus made it available. He's saying, you can have it. But did he make Peter do this? Did he strap Peter to the boat? Did Jesus row the boats out to the middle of the lake? No, he just made it available. Made it available when he said, launch out, launch out. And what did Peter say? At your word. I'm listening and I'm following.
Even when it made no sense to him, it was probably the last thing he wanted to do. He was tired and every bone in his body said, you ain't going to catch nothing. Nevertheless, at your word. Oh, you got to put those words in your mouth all the time, church. Nevertheless, at your word. I'm telling you, there's time coming when the spirit of God is going to speak up in you. He's going to say, hey, it's me. And you're going to know that voice. You're going to say, that's my good shepherd. And he's going to say, launch out. Let's take a step. Let's get out there in the deep, maybe somewhere you hadn't been before. And, you, and every bone in your body is going to say, we've tried it. It makes no sense. I've done the math. It doesn't compute. Nevertheless, at your word. And what did he experience? The blessing, the blessing, the blessing that was on Adam before sin, dominion over the fish of the sea. Jesus, the blessed man, Jesus, the blessed one, demonstrated dominion over the fish of the sea. I don't know how many fish they brought in, but I promise you every sea in that fish came to that boat. What, is there a fish that's going to tell Jesus no? Not a one. The blessing. Somebody say the blessing. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this message. If you need someone to pray with you, there are several ways for you to contact us. Feel free to give us a call at 817-577-0180. You can also contact us through the Legacy Studios app or either of our websites. Giving options are available online at pearsonsministries.com and legacychurch.family. If you prefer, you can also text an offering. Simply text LEGACY in any dollar amount to the number 28950 and follow the prompts. Be blessed today. We love you. And remember, you are always welcome here in the House of Faith.